Welcome everybody to episode 84 of Radicalized Truth Survives. We are thrilled to introduce you to our guest, Michael Weiss, a fabulous investigative reporter who is going to talk to us a bit about Russian espionage as well as agents of influence. Have a listen. Michael, we are so happy to have you here with us today. And before we jump into uh, some of the topics we're going to be discussing today, can you brief our audience on uh, some of the details of your background? Uh, sure. Thanks for having me. I'm uh, Michael Weiss. I'm an investigative journalist um, for more than 10 years. I worked for CNN, The Daily Beast, uh, Yahoo News, and now I'm the editor of the English language version of The Insider, which is a Russian-run and Russian-focused publication, albeit not based in Russia, because you can't really do journalism in that country anymore. So we're a far-flung group, but... Um, I'm also helming a lot of uh, of the deep dive investigations that we're doing with my colleagues, Christo Grozev, famous for the Navalny documentary, and uh, Roman Dabrohotov, who's the editor-in-chief of The Insider, into Russian intelligence operations and influence operations uh, in Europe, the United States, and, and elsewhere. So uh, We in America have this terrible blind spot. Uh, many millions of people um, just can't see how much Russia is interfering in Western democracies. And part of it is that the Russia, Russia, Russia propaganda uh, was actually pretty effective. And we also learned recently from our friend who uh, was a two-time Trump supporter who has now left what he describes as the MAGA cult, that uh, members of this cult have uh, pre-programmed thoughts in their head and they are told to dismiss Russia because all politicians get help from foreign countries, which is what they uh, believe. And yet you keep doing this incredibly vibrant investigative work to show how deep the influence and the uh, infection truly is. And you had a recent breaker. Can you tell us about that? Well, we had three breakers, I would say. Um, <laughs> So we've done a series of investigations in the last two weeks, um, unmasking Russian intelligence officers from a very specific unit of the FSB, which is the domestic security organ, of the Russian Federation, one of the successor agencies of the Soviet KGB. It's known as the Fifth Service. It's technically a military unit. It was founded in the 1990s, but reconstituted in after the so-called color revolutions, which swept Ukraine, Georgia, and Kyrgyzstan, when Putin really became fixated on this idea that uh, the collective West was trying to extirpate Russian influence and, and put an end to Russian hegemony in, in their so-called near abroad. Um, the Fifth Service acts as a foreign intelligence arm of the domestic security service. So it's essentially competing with two other foreign intelligence arms of Russian intelligence, the SVR, which is the successor of the first chief directorate of the KGB. Um, if you've seen the show, The Americans, those guys were first chief directorate, um, albeit uh, part of the illegals program. Um, and the SVR is the civilian foreign intel service. And then there's the GRU, my favorite, because I'm writing a book on them, which is military intelligence which has um, operated uninterrupted since its founding in 1918 on the orders of um, Lenin, uh, and ironically enough, founded to compete with the domestic security organ uh, for the purposes of um, proselytizing and, and really uh, fomenting revolution abroad, chiefly through coups and insurrections. Um, but anyway, the Fifth Service was gained a bit of notoriety in the last uh, year or two because it was the chief um, uh, apparatus that Putin had designated to try and politically destabilize Ukraine beginning in 2014 at the start of the Euromaidan revolution. Uh, the head of the chief service, Sergei Becerra, it was his idea for Viktor Yanukovych, the ousted president of Ukraine, uh, to use lethal force against protesters in Kyiv's main thoroughfare, Maidan. Um, and uh, the Fifth Service also, in the lead up to the full-scale invasion, invasion in February 2022, was meant to foment political unrest, recruit fifth columnists from Ukraine's political establishment, all of which uh, went sideways, to put it mildly, 
um, because Ukraine is still here and it hasn't been conquered. Uh, and, you know, like every other institution in Russia, uh, the Fifth Service is deeply corrupt and they, they stole a lot of money from the till that was earmarked for intelligence operations, probably to enrich themselves. No doubt they have apartments scattered all over Europe and foreign bank accounts galore. Um, but what's interesting is we've done, so we did three investigations about Fifth Service activities well outside of Russia's near abroad or what they would consider their sphere of influence. So three countries were um, Latvia, actually, okay, that's the sphere of influence because that's a Baltic state, but Germany and Italy are the other two. And what we found is Fifth Service intelligence officers who we've unmasked using a host of methodologies, which I'm happy to go into, were running agents in each of these countries, or in the case of Italy, offering to bribe what was at the time the second largest political party in Italian parliament, Lega Nord, and now it's known as Lega, Matteo Salvini's populist reactionary party, offering to bribe them to the tune of $65 million with some Fugazi oil deal where the money would be siphoned, the, the, the oil would be sold at such a discount that the money saved would go straight into the coffers of this political party. And it was actually Salvini's right-hand man um, who was in the room in, in a, in a, or I should say in the hotel in Moscow in 2018, basically negotiating this deal, which was actually recorded and the audio was leaked to Buzzfeed and then published in as the audio file, but also in, in uh, a transcript. Anyway, there was all this question as to who were the Russians on the other side of that table. Their identities were confirmed. And the guy who's relevant to our story, Andrei Karchenko, um, we had only managed up until this point to confirm that he was in the orbit of Alexander Dugin. Uh, in fact, he was a, a protege of Dugin, studied under him. Dugin was his doctoral advisor. Well, it turns out that Karchenko is also a fifth service officer. So this establishes that the Russian government and its intelligence apparatus was effectively trying to uh, bribe and, and co-opt a major European political party. In the case of Germany, we found that another uh, Fifth Service officer, this one who happens to have a moonlighting career as a hip hop star uh, with YouTube videos of him performing in Moscow in the days leading up to Russia's full scale attack on Ukraine. Um, he was um, communicating through Telegram and um, SMS with a, a guy, Vladimir Sergienko, uh, who is an, a Ukraine born um, naturalized German citizen, but as the Germans have since discovered, also obtained Russian citizenship within the last few years. Uh, he was a, an aide to a, a Bundestag deputy, uh, Eugen Schmidt, who is a member of uh, the Alternative for Deutschland party, AFD, which I don't think it's being too uh, euphemistic to say is <laughs> a neo-Nazi party. Uh, and the first neo-Nazi party in post-war German history to get elected to German national parliament. Anyway, uh, since our investigation, Sergienko has resigned from his position. Uh, he's taken on this sort of cast of martyrdom. The insider is trying to get him to commit suicide. Oh, what was him? Long story short, the Germans are now taking this seriously. And as I speak, he, his security clearance to operate in the Bundestag and elsewhere is, is being um, closely scrutinized, shall we say. And then the third, actually, which was the first investigation we did, arguably the biggest in my view, um, we unmasked a, a long time a member of European Parliament, uh, Tatiana Zdanoka, who's a Latvian national, as an agent of the Fifth Service going back 20 years. Um, she had a succession of handlers. We were, um, we, we managed to obtain correspondence, email correspondence between herself and her handlers, um, in which she was asking for money to buy paraphernalia to celebrate Victory Day, which is the Soviet um, memorial, or the, the Russian memorialization of the Soviet Union's defeat of Nazi Germany. Wow. Since 2014 and the takeover of Crimea has been repurposed as a, a, a an ultra patriotic, ultra nationalist uh, event to essentially certify Russian foreign policy, which is to say the war in Ukraine. Right. Uh, so Zdanoka has, been on the hook for the better part of her political career. Um, last we've seen, she's uh, now under investigation by the European Parliament. Uh, there was a resolution passed, signed or voted in uh, to effect by over 140 MEPs calling for an investigation. Um, I think the, the, the official term of art was they were gravely concerned about Russian penetration of their 
political body as well they should be. Also, Latvia's security service, the VDD, which is tantamount to their FBI, has con is begun an investigation into her activities because under Latvian law, rather strangely, up until 2016, it was not a crime to spy for a foreign country. It was only a crime to pass classified intelligence to a foreign country. And she hadn't really done that because she wasn't weird. Um, but we obtained emails showing that as of 2017, she was still taking instructions from her, her handlers and in fact, orchestrating a delegation to St. Petersburg uh, again, I think it was to celebrate Victory Day or something rather, and, and alluded to the fact that she needed some money for this purpose. So wow. as far as we're concerned, she's a full blown agent and has been for a long time. And, you know, the, the one interesting well, the, the commonality of all these cases is when people think of espionage um, and certainly Cold War espionage, they think of, you know, the Americans, they think of uh, Le Carre or the Cambridge Five to put KGB infiltration at its highest, um, which is essentially people who practice good tradecraft have very convincing and plausible legends or cover stories and do not advertise themselves as being pro-Moscow, right? Um, you know, to, to use one case in point, Kim Philby, um, the very picture of the British establishment and actually quite cleverly convinced a great many people because he was sent as a, a correspondent of the Times of London to fratricidal Spain in the 1930s, had pro openly pro-Franco sympathies to the extent that he was able to travel in Franco's entourage, but the whole time was an NKVD agent. Um, so he had this kind of conservative reputation, even though a lot of people close to him knew that he was a communist. Uh, and then in fact, of course, you know, the, the biggest or one of the biggest KGB moles in uh in western history right um so these guys are not exactly kim philby uh they are all outspoken in their support for russia uh yeah. Stavka literally had a member of the moscow city council also by the way an fsb officer come to riga campaign for her in the early aughts and disperse cash to ethnic russian veterans of whatever wars from the soviet period um, she has voted against the condemnation of Russia for invading Ukraine, was one of only 13 MEPs to do so, uh, has been trafficking in all, all kinds of Russian propaganda tropes about the recrudescence of fascism or Nazism in the Baltic states. She runs down her own country or the country she claims to represent. Um, you know, these guys were, you might say, hiding in plain sight. Sergienko himself, also very pro-Moscow. Um, has given speeches, has written speeches for the AFD, where they talk about being opposed to any kind of sanctions on Russia. Uh, they don't support Ukrainian security assistance. In fact, one of the tasks Sergienko had been given by his FSB handler, the rapper, uh, was to initiate a kind of lawfare against the German government, alleging that any um, uh, weapon systems or military equipment that uh, the Olaf Scholz's chancellery sent to Ukraine was unconstitutional without getting a buyer leave from the Bundestag. So they actually did inaugurate a lawsuit, didn't go anywhere. And obviously Germany has now given more stuff to Ukraine than any other country in Europe. But still, the idea, the goal was to slow or hinder in the specific letter, in the specific wording of the, the tasks, uh, the, the uh, deploy or the um, dispatch of Leopard 2 tanks from Germany. So this was a, a you know, set of instructions from Moscow Center to one of their agents who only happens to be a parliamentary aide saying, please stop wow. helping Ukraine. Wow. Right so wow. that's another commonality, too. Uh, they're all very pro-Russian, outwardly so. But the the mainstay of their endeavors was to try and hinder Western support for Ukraine, either diplomatically or militarily or financially. Wow. Well done, Jim. Uh, wow. Wow. Um, so there are a lot of things that you touched on uh, that that uh, are really, I think, important. Um, thank you, first of all, for breaking down Russian intelligence services. That is a very confusing set of, of acronyms to people, and I think it's really important they understand the difference between the you know SVR and the GRU in particular. I'm fascinated that you're writing a book on the GRU. Um, uh, my focus, uh, a lot of my focus has been on Mike Flynn because I think he is a, uh, a national security risk. 
Um, and Mike Flynn is the only American, to my knowledge, to go to GRU headquarters. We went to GRU headquarters in June of 2013, seven months before GRU Spetsnaz soldiers, uh, you know, basically traipsed in without any peep from mm -hmm. the Pentagon. Um, Mike Flynn was head of the Defense Intelligence Agency at the time and was actively saying there's no, no, uh, there's no danger here. Um, so I am fascinated uh, by the, what you said about the GRU's primary focus being coups and insurrections. Right. Historically, yes, but they they also do just basic uh, espionage. So intelligence, lot, yes. is, right? So they they have, I mean, similar to the SVR, um, they have their own residenturas stationed abroad, working out of embassies. So, I mean, it's it's a rule of thumb if your title is deputy defense attaché from the Russian <laughs> embassy, I'd put money on the table that you work for somebody else as well. Um, and right. yet, you know, Michael Flynn was the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, which is not the perfect counterpart because they don't really do what the GRU does abroad. But it is the mirror image in the sense that they're both intel military intelligence services. And whether or not he's the only American to go to the aquarium uh, remains to be seen, because who knows what other Americans have traipsed those hallowed halls. But he's certainly the only active duty at the time intelligence officer, high ranking intelligence officer to be invited in, uh, right. which itself is its own provocation. And, you know, look, at the time I, I knew sort of where uh, the, the Michael Flynn worldview was headed, for lack of a better term. And mm -hmm. his grand conceit was, you know, he, he believes that the West is at war with radical Islam, as embodied not just by ISIS and then, uh, you know, or Al Qaeda and then ISIS style Sunni jihadism, but also Shia jihadism as embodied by the Islamic Republic of Iran and all of its proxy groups. And he was convinced that he could strategically divorce Russia from Iran and bring Russia into the Western sort of community to f go to war against all of Islam um, or Islamic jihadism, if you want to be generous to Michael Flynn, although I wouldn't be because I know, again, he's. He's a little bit, uh, not a little bit, but deeply hysterical and paranoid and conspiracist. Uh, so this was a gift to the Russians because, A, I mean, that's never going to happen. Even before the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, I'd been arguing that the minute Russia was invited into Syria in 2015, an invitation which, by the way, um, was either initiated but certainly underwritten, certified by Qasem Soleimani, the head of the Quds Force, which is the expeditionary arm of the Revolutionary Guard Corps of Iran, the relationship between Moscow and Tehran was um, irrevocable. They, they are strategically wedded to each other. And in fact, I mean, the reason Iran cared so much about Syria was Syria is the through point to Lebanon. And without Syria, um, I, I think it was a, a, a defecting Syrian general who told me um, Hezbollah would shrivel up and die in Lebanon. And that is by far the most important proxy organization that Iran has created. So, you know, Putin did the, the Iranians a solid. And now the Iranians are doing Putin a solid by yeah. sending Zahid drones uh, and other kit, possibly even missiles, uh, according to the Wall Street Journal, although I don't know if they've been delivered. But um, yeah, I mean, they're they're now helping uh, Russia's con war of conquest in Ukraine. So what but Michael Flynn had been convinced and no doubt the Russians, the GRU in particular, were, were abetting uh, this delusion that, um, you know, with a little bit of tender, loving care and and perhaps some incentivizing, the United States could cleave Moscow away from Tehran. And God knows what else he got up to in GRU headquarters and or for that matter at the RT uh, 10 year anniversary gala, which he attended. As well, that, yeah. Yeah. That, that, that is an entire subject. Um, in my view, you know, it's basically where world war three started from a information narrative warfare perspective. Um, after that, you know, a couple months after that, the, the, the Russians um, hacked the DNC got a whole bunch of, of content, which was then used by Mike Flynn and his army of 
digital soldiers to smear Hillary Clinton, which led to all kinds of, of shit in 2016. So in my view, there's a, there's a through line from, you know, the dude going to a, a GRU headquarters, uh, allowing Crimea to be um, invaded, getting fired, and then going to Moscow and all of a sudden being in charge of this very, very large disinformation campaign. At least that that is my uh, perspective on what's going on. And, you know, if you fast forward that eight years, it hasn't really stopped. So I'm very interested in the in the in the, the GRU in particular and what their methods and um, tactics are um, when they go when they try and um, subvert a country to create a coup, to create an insurrection. Um, because I see January 6th, for example, as, you know, it, it wasn't a Russian operation per se, uh, but there was a lot of uh, Russian um, backing behind it and people who are connected to Russia uh, involved in it. Yeah, I mean, you know, I would say that the, the short raison d'etre of the GRU, again, going back more than 100 years, is to prepare the Soviet Union stroke Russia for war with the West. Yeah. So they recruit agents um, in scientific technical capabilities, uh, obviously any kind of military hardware or technology they want desperate to get their hands on. The GRU had an integral role in infiltrating the Manhattan Project. Everyone thinks of the Rosenbergs and the KGB. In fact, Klaus Fuchs, um, probably without whom uh, there would be no bomb in, in the Soviet Union or it wouldn't have, wouldn't have been built as quickly as it had been. He was recruited by the GRU and handled by the GRU. Uh, Oval, another character who actually was born in the United States and his parents made the reverse immigration back to Soviet Russia um, and was recruited by the GRU there, then sent back to the United States as the perfect kind of illegal because he spoke fluent English with no accent, joined the U.S. Army, uh, gets seconded into this sort of scientific program and then ends up infiltrating both Oak Ridge, Tennessee and uh, Dayton, Ohio, uh, and steals the urchin, which is the kind of triggered mechanism for the, the bomb. Um, so a lot of GRU spies responsible for helping Stalin build the weapon of mass destruction well before uh, internal Soviet know-how suggested they, they would have been able to do it. Um, the most famous GRU case and I think a lot of people who know some of this history uh, through popular culture or through, you know, every so often there's some graying mane on the Upper West Side of Manhattan who insist Alger Hiss was innocent and framed. But the whole Whitaker Chambers Alger Hiss affair, which really creates spy mania in the United States in the late 1940s, wow. early 1950s, wow. set the mood music for the Cold War, but also for McCarthyism. Um, that was a GRU operation. Whitaker Chambers and Alger Hiss were both GRU agents. Um, and Whitaker Chambers, of course, defects from the underground, becomes the most famous ex-communist stroke anti-communist, and then shows the documentary evidence that there were agents in the State Department. Um, you know, just because McCarthy was a hysterical know-nothing doesn't mean that there wasn't actual Soviet infiltration of the U.S. government, right? There, there was. Um, he just didn't know who they were and he was making it up. But, but you know, we, we know this now, not just from things like the pumpkin papers in real time, but there was a, a project run by the NSA called the Venona Project, which was basically we had decrypted Soviet communications from um, Washington, D.C., where the embassy was, and also New York, where the mission to the U.N., um, but also the big consulate here were. Uh, and this was traffic going back to Moscow, where the Russians or the Soviets would actually sometimes even name, leak by their legal name, agents that they were running, as well as by um, their cryptonyms or their, their cover names. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, and a lot of this history didn't really come to light until decades on. Uh, in the 1990s, thanks to Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the late senator from New York, and the Freedom of Information Act, the Venona Project was declassified. And so suddenly all of this, this welter of information that was in possession of the FBI for decades about who was actually a Soviet spy was 
publicly ventilated. And we're still arguing about this stuff and the credibility of it and, and, and so on and so forth. But, you know, suffice it to say, 2016, I think for a lot of people was, oh, shit, you know, the Russians are infiltrating our political establishment and they're spying on us and they're, they're doing things to destabilize this country. Nothing new under the sun there. Um, you know, the extent to which they've done this going back, I mean, at that point, uh, almost 100 years was pretty well documented. You know, I mean, it was it, and, and we had only really scratched the surface of it well into the 1980s, because, as I say, I mean, a lot of ancient history is now very relevant again and being being resurfaced. I mean, you know, you, you want to talk about GRU psychological warfare. I uh, one of the manuals that I've curated, which is, you know, we've had them translated and then I try to explain the the, the, the relevance of them is a. a, a educational module um, taught by GRU officers in the um, military university in Moscow to cadets. And it's about GRU psychological warfare. What's interesting about it is it, it talks about the sort of hierarchical changes or the organizational structure from the late 90s until now. I'm not going to bore you with those details, but the, the top line is a decision was taken right at the moment when Russia was at its weakest. The Soviet Union had collapsed the intelligence services were kind of in pieces on the floor. A lot of veterans from the KGB and the GRU were being rendered unemployed or they had retired or whatever, looking to make money, working for oligarchs or being farmed out to organized crime, whatever. But a decision was taken around 1993, 1994 to reconstitute uh, the nature of psychological warfare as prosecuted by the GRU. And at that time, they decided they are no longer going to draw a distinction between peacetime and wartime. They will use all instruments at their disposal, which is to say all state institutions, but also, and here's where it gets really interesting, civil society organizations, sports clubs, diaspora organizations, anything in Russian society, both inside Russia and outside Russia, with ties to Moscow, can be seconded to essentially conduct disinformation and propaganda campaigns, uh, weaken Western political resolve, social cohesion, all the kinds of things you saw in 2016. And, you know, you mentioned the hacking of the DNC. Yeah, that was GRU. Um, but beyond that, and, you know, th the extent to which this had a material impact on the election is something that will be studied for decades and nobody's ever going to come to a firm conclusion about it. But Yevgeny Prigozhin's troll farm in St. Petersburg now it is, I think, beyond dispute, Wagner, but also the entire Prigozhin Empire yeah. was carried aloft. Well, as Putin himself admitted after Prigozhin conducted his abortive mutiny or coup in last summer, completely financed by the Russian state. But also it's a cutout. It's, mm -hmm. it's an instrument. It's a tool of the GRU, mm -hmm. a plausibly deniable private military company stroke um, information technology company but really that, that prosecutes Russia's military campaigns, not just against the United States or right. France or Germany, but also, I mean, Africa, it's probably their biggest portfolio. They're running mercenaries. They are doing political consultancy style campaigns where literally in some countries they have staked every candidate running for office, like in Libya. Um, you know, it's, yeah, it's Eric Prince just said, by the way, I don't know if you saw this, that we should colonize all of Africa, <laughs> which yeah, so, coming coming from Prigozhin's best friend is not exactly shocking. Yeah, I mean, look, you have to understand a lot of uh, a lot of the time. It's funny. There, there was a, a term that was uh, introduced to the Russia watching lexicon more than a decade ago, the Gerasimov Doctrine which is named for Valery Gerasimov, the chief of general staff. Whether or not he's still alive is anyone's guess. I think no one's yeah. heard of him from him in weeks or months. Um, but the idea was this is the way Russia will go to war. And yeah. it was, you know, sort of the, the codification of hybrid warfare. You know, you, you do the propaganda campaigns, you dispatch special forces to politically destabilize and to blow stuff up. And then finally, the, the army comes in. What got lost in the sauce of the Gerasimov doctrine discourse is the fact that Gerasimov based this white paper, and it was all, you know, an es a long essay basically he wrote. 
he based this white paper on what the United States had been doing by his lights or interpretation mm -hmm. during the global war on terror, Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, et cetera. Um, and in very many cases, you find that what the Russians are doing is this kind of distorted version of what they think we are doing or how they see us conducting our foreign policy or our military interventions. Um, and, you know, if you mention Eric Prince, I mean, everybody knows Blackwater and their notorious role in Iraq. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I have no doubt in my mind that the Russians are like, oh, we should get on that, that, that action. Mm -hmm. But unlike Blackwater, which can be held to account, um, let's just create a para-state apparatus and claim, oh, it's just a business enterprise, nothing to do with us, when in fact, I mean, I've seen evidence that, you know, Wagner was going around, I call it Wagner, but it's really a, a much larger enterprise than just the yeah. person before. They were going around Africa cutting arms deals with any number of kleptocratic yeah. tin pot dictatorships, yeah. and they were being signed on behalf of the Ministry of Defense. So for a long time, we were in denial that, oh, Wagner, wow. it's a private military company. Bullshit. It was never a private <laughs> military company. <laughs> Thank Where you so much for that. Our is catty-cornered across from a GRU Spetsnaz training facility. You know, I don't remember Blackwater having their military camps in the United States at, you know, name your... At, at, at Fort Bragg? Fort Bragg. There you go. Yeah. I think it's so important in the report that you were referencing and the translating work that you did that uh, you noted the bottom line for spy recruitment comes down to this. Look for the losers, especially the ones who want to think they are winners because they hang on to important positions. I bring that up because there's mass confusion in the West when people uh, are actually Russian propagandists and there is just this this denial that, oh, this person couldn't be, or this candidate, or this uh, military person, you know, or this podcaster, no. They found the misfits, often with, uh, you know, backgrounds that include some sort of sexual deviancy. And I just bring that up because I want to thank you, because that clue that you gave us led to Kira Giles giving us the best 84-second explainer on what makes the perfect propagandist. So, Kudos to you for that. The other thing I want to say before Hi-Fi uh, jumps in is the menace of unreality. The uh, report that you did on the Kremlin weaponizing information, culture, and money. Can you just, we're going to link to uh, all of this stuff in our YouTube text, but can you just give us uh, one or two high concept lines on the menace of unreality? Because I think that is what we are trying to you know, uh, alert everybody to. Yeah, so uh, this is a report that was published in 2014. Uh, I wrote it with Peter Pomerantsev, you know, who's a brilliant historian of contemporary Russia and also of, of propaganda, which I think this report was sort of his uh, dress rehearsal for the, the books that he's written. Um, look, we were just examining how Russian disinformation um, was really kind of a shaping exercise for the first invasion of Ukraine. Uh, and trying to understand how everything old is new again, because this was all very tried and true Soviet KGB, GRU tactics, um, active measures, as it was known and frankly still is. Uh, and we just tried to resurface some not so um, ancient history. Uh, and this report actually took off in ways that we couldn't have fathomed at the time. Although, funnily enough, in, in hindsight, it looks a bit quaint. Um, because we did not anticipate that um, that all of these sort of tricks of the trade were going to be used in such a hyper-caffeinated fashion against the United States in particular and trying to sway a U.S. presidential election. I mean, we were looking mostly, we thought, oh, Europe, they're going to muck about, Africa, of course, um, the former third world now, developing world countries. That's always been fertile soil to sow conspiracy theories and sort of cockamamie schemes. I mean, the idea that the United States and the CIA created the AIDS virus. Uh, that took off in Africa, um, largely thanks to KGB active measures. Um, although they did have one market success, which I believe we mentioned in the report, which was the JFK uh, assassination conspiracy theory, which made its way into the annals of popular culture through Oliver Stone's movie, JFK. Um, that the CIA in league with the Johnson administration or the John, Lyndon Johnson, then vice president, had, had 
concocted the scheme to murder the president. Still this being said by Roger Stone and Mike Flynn right now, by right. the way. Like right. today. So this, yeah. the history of this, and it's been proved um, through things like the McTruckin archive, which is a KGB archive that's literally smuggled to the West all of their in-house documentation or most of their in-house documentation, that this was an active measure cooked up by the KGB, um, which relied at the time on a newspaper journalist, I believe an Italian. So it was first floated or surfaced in an Italian newspaper, and then it works its way through Europe, across the Atlantic, winds up in the New Orleans prosecutor's office where it becomes, it takes on a life beyond even just a conspiracy theory, it becomes its own mythos, right? And to this day, people still believe that JFK was killed by his own government or by the deep state. Um, Maladets, hats off to the Soviets. They they really knocked one out the park on that score. But they hadn't tried and done anything at the level which we saw in 2016. And I mean, look, I want to draw a, a kind of nuanced distinction here because I have to be honest, like I, I, I spent the better part of 2016, 2017 turning on cable news and listening to people who all of a sudden were disinformation experts and, you know, claim to have all of these sort of bona fides and credentials in the intelligence community, uh, knowing how these things work. And I heard a lot of errant nonsense, um, which did not really get at the heart of how these operations are conducted. Um, oftentimes, what ends up happening is we conflate Russian amplification or Russian encouragement of homegrown lunacy uh, for a Russian concocted intelligence operation or a Russian concocted influence operation. So, you know, for all the the the, the crazy shit that we heard, uh, Pizzagate, um, you know, now Taylor Swift and and the deep state and all this stuff, there was really one, and when I say documented, I, I should say reported example where something was actually a product of a Russian intelligence service from the 2016, 2017 period. And that was Seth Rich was killed by the DNC. Michael Isikoff at Yahoo News reported this was actually an SVR active measure. Great. Everything else, um, and, and again, we have a hard time reckoning with just how, how how sort of messed up and deteriorating our own society is, and, and certainly our own politics is, um, that we like to pretend it's the Russians all the time. When really, a lot of the time, the Russians can't believe their luck because all they have to do is just hold up a mirror to ourselves and show us yeah. ourselves. And yeah. it may be a funhouse mirror, there may be some distortion and some caricature, but you know, we are creating the problem. They're just, I, I liken them to, you know, like watching lemmings run off a cliff. The Russians are the guys at the precipice of the cliff holding up signs, say, keep going, keep going, you're almost there. You know, they they, they want us to commit yeah. kind of collective suicide in this respect. The, the, the IRA tools wow. were very not to take away part, from right? The fact that they are doing things all the time and they are planting seeds and they are kind mm -hmm. of, you know, creating patient zero and, and, and all of that. But you have to you have to prove these things. You can't just allege or you can't just go on what it feels like. Um, and that's the danger, you know, and, and on the other side of the ledger, because a lot of people were declaring victory after the Mueller report, um, which, by the way, was pretty light on counterintelligence. Remember that the two yes. missions yeah. Mueller were conspiracy and obstruction of justice. The Senate subcommittee on intelligence reports, either five volumes, much more substantive, much more in depth, and much more interesting. But I'll say this I mentioned Venona. What the US government or the intelligence community knew about Soviet agents in the State Department, the Treasury Department, or you know, low level bureaucracies in real time, but could not prove publicly because to bring these people to book would out the existence of the Venona project which was so sensitive and so high value that they would rather let Soviet spies get away with being Soviet spies than compromise their intelligence collecting mechanism. Wow. Nothing has changed. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a reason a lot of people end up getting indicted for lying to the FBI, mm -hmm. which is a low order offense. It's an offense to be sure, but it's a low order offense compared to other things the FBI might have on those people. So, for instance, a lot of people in the 1930s and 40s who were Soviet agents, uh, at the time you could expel them because they were illegal immigrants because they came here under falsified 
identities, right? Or you could get them for lying to the FBI. The FBI would interrogate them and say, you know, have you done this? Have you done that? Oh, of course not. Well, meanwhile, the FBI has Soviet intercepts proving they'd done all that and more. And then they got them online, right? Or they got them online for some other petty offense. The point is they did not want to go to court with the information they had because the method of gathering the information was so much more valuable than wow. burning this one agent. So again, we have not yet wow. in the history of the 2016, 2017 period. And anybody who knows the, the, the history of intelligence in this country or in the West, frankly, knows it can take decades for things to be declassified. It can take mm -hmm. decades for, you know, dead to rights agents of foreign governments to be definitively proven as such. Um, so I, I think a lot of people get, you know, they, they err on the side of sensationalism or kind of automatic vindication when neither of these things are are called for. Wow. You know, it's not evidence based. It's again, it's it's usually ideologically driven or, in, I mean, in the case of some people, it just, you know, you talk about grifters. We have grifters too, who claim, oh, everyone's a, a Russian agent or the Russians are doing this, that, and the other. I got COVID, it must be Russia. <laughs> You're now doing their work for them because you are now amplifying or you are, you are, you are basically aggrandizing them to the point that they want to be taken seriously as this, right. you know, this well, global they see, they, with with a long arm that can reach into to you know sort of every uh, sector of society uh, from here to Timbuktu. I mean, they're they're powerful. Not, powerful. If I might, on that note, it's it's interesting to me with the Tucker Putin interview. Mm -hmm. There seem to be there seems to be, and I've written about this, a move to just going overt with a lot of these people. In other words, they're they're they're. Uh, adoration for Putin, their their you know preference for Russian um, ideals, uh, at least as they conceive them, versus American ideals is is now becoming fashionable. Let's put it that way, um, in ways that I haven't I haven't seen uh, in a long time. Well, yeah, but okay. So you, you talk about losers as being um, you know very susceptible to recruitment, and and keep in mind. You know, the KGB has an entire classification system for, I mean, what you would kind of generously or, or somewhat euphemistically call useful idiots to full-blown recruited and or compensated agents. Uh, and you have an entire kind of gray area of what's known as the agent of influence. Mm. That kind of agent of influence is somebody who doesn't even know that he or she is being controlled or manipulated and thinks that they're th that these sort of grand designs that they've come up with. Um, Bashar al-Assad never gassed anyone. It was Syrian rebels staging it with the white helmets or it was all a psyop. They, they think that they've actually, you know, alighted upon this idea when in fact it's been, it's been cooking, it's been cultivating uh, in them by, uh, by the Russian intelligence services, right? So sometimes it pays not to let someone know you're working for Moscow. You just you let them think that they're they have this revealed truth that the, the, the bovine masses simply don't have access to. Um, in some cases, as in you know our Latvian friend uh, Miss Zanoka, they know exactly what they're doing, and you know they communicate in such a way that that bespeaks you know having the 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 the, the uh, parlance and the the knowledge of an agent handler relationship. Um, but yeah, we have in this country, I would say, a host of people who, you know, they, 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 they've, they've, in, 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 they've convinced themselves that because, quote unquote, Russiagate was a big hoax or a conspiracy theory uh, and that, you know, Mueller himself did not frog march Donald Trump out of the Oval Office in handcuffs and accuse him of being a Russian spy and then, you know, pull back a curtain and Boris and Natasha are there in handcuffs and Boris is twirling his mustache and Natasha is speaking in some cartoonish <laughs> fashion. No, seriously, this is what people were expecting. Right. Because they don't know mm -hmm. how counterintelligence works. They don't know how law enforcement works. They don't know how espionage works. True. Because none of this happened, they've now convinced themselves that Russia has been exonerated of all malevolence and, and, and wrongdoing, that they didn't interfere in the election in any way, that if Putin invaded Ukraine, that too was the fault of the CIA and the State Department. And Russia is the victim rather than the perpetrator. Now, this is a great success, an accidental one for Moscow, because again, I think they interfered with the election with an eye toward muddying the waters, uh, weakening Hillary Clinton, 
creating division and polarization, did they think that they would actually succeed or did they think that their dark horse candidate would win the presidency? Maybe not. But the fact that he did and the fact that we began litigating the extent to which his presidency is the result of a foreign intervention was a gift to the Russians because now they look like they can control America's political establishment, whether or not they can. I mean, I would argue they cannot, but we are doing our utmost to give them a lot of props and a lot of credibility. Um, and, you know, I mean, right now what you're seeing is America's tearing itself apart. The fact that Donald Trump has at least a 50 percent chance of regaining the White House is absolutely terrifying to somebody like myself and to our European friends. But to Russia, they, are, they cannot believe their good fortune. So what are they going to do? Again, they're going to amplify people who are already predisposed to supporting. It's not even that they're pro-Putin and pro-Russia. Some of them are. Some of them have legitimately drunk the Kool-Aid that Putin is this sort of bastion of religious conservatism. I mean, he's literally built himself a $1.5 billion Kublai Khan pleasure dome on the Black Sea. Mm -hmm. Stripper poles. I mean, this is the most... You know, like if this guy were in an 80s movie, he'd be in the backseat of the limo, getting blowjobs, snorting lines of coke off cross. <laughs> he is as conservative as Larry Flint was conservative. Right? <laughs> but you have people who legitimately think that this guy is, you know, he stands for everything that they want to believe in. You know, ultra patriotism, orthodoxy, blah, blah, blah. Fine. So they're not very bright or they haven't bothered to interrogate the issue. Um, but then you have people who just they have such disdain for their own country and their own society. And they are convinced, you know, I mean, Tucker is a, is a classic example. And even Putin was frankly tweaking him for this. Tucker applies for a job at the CIA. The CIA says, no, mm, he's, he's, he's going to be, he's going to be boiling about that for a while. Right. The sense of grievance. How dare I Tucker Carlson heir to the frozen fish stick fortune or whatever, you know, I, I am to the manor born. Of course I should be a, a, a knighted officer of the clandestine services. Clandestine services says, no, we don't like the cut of your jib. Fuck off. His entire career is built on desiring desperately to be taken seriously by the establishment to which he really belongs. That's the irony of this. I mean, he's richer than 99.9% .9 of Americans, right? He had TV shows on successive cable news networks, each one a failure until he got one on Fox. And he just started saying shit that, that made people feel like they were one of him. Even though they made no money like he does, they had none of the indulgences or the privileges that he's got. He made, he made being a loser feel like a winning position, right? Wow. So I'm not saying that this is a guy who's going to be recruited by the Russians. So he doesn't need to be. He, he already gives them everything that they want simply by being this sort of snarling, contrarian conspiracy theorist who does it simply because he can't stand the people who tell him he's wrong. You don't have to do anything with that. And similarly, I would you know suggest that Donald Trump, in many ways, was already a, a kind of ready-made, when I say asset, I don't mean a controlled asset, but an agent of influence to be sure. Because again, he doesn't even know that he's doing the bidding of somebody else. Right. Well, he went to Moscow and in... conclusion, uh, the, the less generous one or the one that, you know, may one day come to light is, oh, yeah, you know, they had him financially or they'd compromise him in some other way. Mm -hmm. He knew what he was doing. He knew that there was a relationship, but he he tried to even then, though, psychologically, you can convince yourself you're not really working for somebody else. You're mm -hmm. doing it all of your own accord. You know, the, the only the one thing I will say is I don't think that Donald Trump would have had the idea to attack NATO in the New York Times in 1987. I don't think that was his idea. I think somebody gave him that I idea. See, I could see Trump thinking right. that, you know, everything is a racket except yeah. my own business empire. Yeah, yeah. Everything sure. is mismanaged. Sure. Everybody's Everything is run yeah. incorrectly. You know, if, if I were president, I would make everyone in NATO meet the 2% threshold or, of defense yeah. funding and all that. I just don't know if he'd heard of NATO when he was, you know. <laughs> well, yeah. Look, I, this, this, I think what may have begun as him thinking that this was a kind of clever populist position, that we're, that NATO and Europe is sort of the welfare queen of the world and the United States right. is, is floating it. Now he is out to destroy NATO. He is out to sever the transatlantic relationship we have with our European allies because he doesn't like that they all hate him and are deeply suspicious of him as as a political figure. Um, he absolutely detests the country of Ukraine because in his mind, 
It's bound up inextricably with his first impeachment because he tried to blackmail the Ukrainian political leadership. Um, he sees a guy like Putin or she or Kim Jong-un for that matter. And he's like, why can't I have that? They just do what they want. They don't need to buy your lead. There's no checks and balances. They don't have to deal with opposition. They don't have to deal with critics. They don't have to deal with free press scrutinizing their every move. They just, you know, if they don't like someone, they kill them or they throw them in jail. Why can't mm -hmm. I do that? You know, he has a, 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 an intrinsic authoritarian bent. And I think one of the reasons he's looking abroad for strong men, allies and friends is he just he, he, he wants very much what they've managed to grab for themselves. And the fact that he can't get it fully, at least not yet, angers him more than anything. I got two final questions for you. First one goes back to your book, ISIS Inside the Army of Terror. Uh, you wrote that with Hassan Hassan. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things you talk about is the digital radicalization of foot soldiers for ISIS. Mm -hmm. Do you see any parallels between that uh, dissociative traumatic propaganda that ISIS was using, the beheadings and whatnot, and the propaganda and digital radicalization that you are seeing in the QAnon slash MAGA world today? Do you see similarities? So the big problem the U.S. government had uh, at the start of the anti-ISIS campaign was they couldn't understand why ISIS, unlike most totalitarian movements in history, actually leaned into their atrocities. They luxuriated in carnage. So, you know, they, they, they would set a Jordanian airman on fire in a cage and watch as the skin literally melted off his body. And they would upload that to the Internet and say, this is what we do to, I mean... So f their whole strategy was uh, moral equivalency. So everyone watched the, the, the horrific brutality of their snuff videos, but they didn't really pay attention to what was prologue to that, which was this like, ranting discourse about how uh, the United States, along with the um, illegitimate Muslim countries of the Middle East, are dropping bombs on our women and children. So this is what we will do to the tyrannical or the infidel soldiers that we capture, right? And they made no distinction uh, if you were James Foley or if you were active duty military anywhere, like you were still part of the same system. So they could cut your head, they could crucify you, they could set you alight. And what nobody could understand, and I had these discussions with State Department and you name it, why are people still drawn to this? Why are people leaving, you know, their homes in Minnesota to try and go to Turkey and then smuggle themselves across the Syrian border to join ISIS. So because they, they really believe in this moral equivalency and it's the same kind of moral equivalency that, you know, Osama bin Laden, albeit he was more careful in how he pressed this point. There's a reason for instance, you know, these Zoomer morons are reading bin Laden's letter to America from 20, 2001 and saying, this is the most eye opening thing I've ever seen. It does scare me a little bit because we've now entered into I've heard it called the post-truth age. I would just call it a very kind of um, nihilistic moment in American history, to be sure, also probably international history, where you don't have to uh, you don't have to hide the worst of yourself. All of your your venality, your vindictiveness, your murderous rage, all of the things you would try to cover up if, for instance, you were the Soviet Union. There's no famine here. Our, our gulags are models of re-education and rehabilitation. All of these things, you spend a great deal of energy trying to uh, obfuscate. Now, you don't do that anymore. You lean into it. Yeah, I'm, I'm a piece of shit. I want to go out and kill people with AR-15s for the lulls because it's funny because it, I own the libs by doing that. The salesmanship is... It's, it's all negative. It's not, there's no positive prescription anymore. So with MAGA, what does MAGA want to build? They, 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 you know, they sometimes talk about, you know, more jobs here, secure the borders, make America great again, literally the slogan. How do you want to make America great again? Everything you are advocating is some form of violent destruction. You want to destroy American institutions. You want to put people in prison because you don't like what they write about you in the newspaper um, you don't want to save countries from acts of aggression, if not full-scale wars of conquest. In fact, you're going to egg on 
countries like Russia to invade your putative allies. It's all just tear it apart. And what do you want to build in its stead? I mean, they sort of grasp for answers. But I think at this point, you know, Trump might have had more of a, a kind of prescriptive um, campaign in 2016. This time around, it's all predicated on revenge. It's all predicated on, you know, everything must fall. And a lot of people are signing up for it because, again, they, they feel like they've been jilted or disenfranchised. You know, where's my fair share? How come my life is so miserable and everybody else's life is good? Not everybody else's, but the elites who control the world or this government, you know, it's all a conspiracy. So the only way to destroy a conspiracy is through revolution. And January 6th was a foretaste of what they'd like to accomplish. You know, final question for you. Final question. So you have exposed Russian intel in Latvia. Uh, we know that Russian intel was carrying out operations in Moldova. We know that they were in Bulgaria. Uh, you exposed someone in Brussels, in Belgium. Uh, you know that they are in Germany, that Russian intelligence agencies are infiltrating in Germany. We know that Russia is working with uh, Marie Le Pen. Um, we know that Russia was offering money to the Catalonian independence uh, movement. We know that the UK, it, it's now referred to as London grad because of all the Russian money laundering. We know that Russians were behind CalExit. We know that they were running black nationalist groups in Florida. Um, why do you think that Americans are so oblivious to the fact that Russia is engaged in hybrid warfare against our country. When you oversell and underdeliver, that tends to be the defining moment rather than the actual malfeasance or the, the actual malign activity that takes place. So if you ask people, schoolboys, about the Cold War, uh, they can easily rattle off all the crimes of McCarthyism and talk about blacklists and talk about people vilified through witch hunts and so and so. Um, similarly, I think if you did a kind of Vox Populi experiment about Trump Russia, hey, he didn't go to prison for spying for Russia. Nobody was, was actually imprisoned for spying for Russia. Therefore, it stands to reason, again, according to this popular misconception, that the Russians didn't do anything wrong. You know, but I, I said earlier in the show, Soviet penetration of the U.S. government was real. And it was, if anything, more extensive than what its most ignorant and febrile propagandists at the time were saying. They just didn't have the facts. But the facts today, as known, show the, the, the totality of it. Similarly, yeah, you, you, know, you can point to any number on a weekly, monthly basis. There are DOJ indictments of you know, FSB-run agents in the United States, cyber warfare or cyber espionage mm -hmm. operations, uh, one of which was the single largest cyber attack in human history, crippled international commerce. We didn't know about this until years later when the U.S. government finally issued its, its indictments for um, not Petya, which is a bit of malware that started in Ukraine uh, through the Russian services and then was so wildly successful, it, it got away from the GRU masters who installed the, the, the malware to the point where literally like it cost billions of dollars in damages to global shipping. It shut down hospital systems in rural Pennsylvania. Um, all of these things happen. And unfortunately, people, they either don't have the attention span or the wherewithal to understand the gravity of what's taking place. Or, I mean, just because the wheels do turn slowly in a democratic system, by the time the full sort of docket comes to light, uh, we've already moved on to other things. Oh, what you, this happened in 2018? Pfft, ancient history, who cares? Right. Can't be happening now, right? So what, what is taking place as we speak, chances are a good number of these operations will not be exposed or talked about or written about or known for years to come. And, you know, this is the danger. Um, the Russians like to kind of like Narishkin, the head of the SVR, recently gave a comment about having taken... I think he said hundreds of American intelligence officers off the chessboard. Mm -hmm. A dark illusion to could be any number of things. He could just be making it up. He could be saying it as his own kind of provocation. But they've also, they, they like to troll us by saying, yeah. we're doing things unseen and getting away with them and that have been wildly successful. 
and you won't know about this for a long time. And they're right because they do do that. Um, but again, it, it, you, you, you have to be you have to be conservative and you have to have a nuanced approach to this. It doesn't mean that the Russians are controlling America. It doesn't mean that they are going to actually install the next president of the United States. It can be a little more subtle. It can be a little more complicated. It could be a little more accidental than that, you know, but they are, I mean, we run the risk of, you know, given some of the Keystone cops style operations we've unmasked from, you know, my, my colleagues, Christo and, and, and uh, Roman exposed the Skripal assassins who were caught on CCTV camera, very poor trade craft, bad legends, passports in, issued in sequential order, which is a no, no, cause that's, that's a giveaway that you're a spy. They were able to identify the two guys that, that poisoned Sergey and Yulia Skripal with Novichuk. Okay. So we all, we, we kind of sit there and laugh and say, you know, not exactly James Bond style espionage, but they still managed to turn a cathedral city into a kind of no-go area for the space of several weeks. They still killed an innocent bystander, Don Sturgis. Um, and we also are still piecing together operations perpetrated by GRU Unit 29155, the unit to which uh, Mishkin and Chapiga belonged. We're, we're piecing these things together a decade after the fact. I mean, we just did a story, you mentioned Bulgaria. The first terrorist operation 29155 conducted, as far as we know, was blowing up an ammunition depot in Bulgaria in 2011. That's three years before the invasion of Ukraine and the seizure of Crimea. It's in the midst of the Obama-Russian reset. Remember that? Um, and this was at a time when, you know, if you talked about Russia as a geopolitical threat, as Mitt Romney did, you were accused of having Romnesia or still inhabiting a Cold War mentality. Well, who's inhabiting yeah. the Cold War mentality this entire time? You know, the greatest danger is Russia considers itself in a state of war with the West. It's not actually, you know, full-blown total war, not yet anyway. Um, it's low intensity, perhaps. It's definitely cold. And we have only just realized that we're at war. Yeah. So the, the greatest adversary you can have is one that doesn't even realize it is an adversary. Because then you eat their lunch. Do you think the president of the United States will ever acknowledge the fact that we are at war? I think, you know, I, I can understand the political incentive to not traffic mm -hmm. in alarmist or hysterical rhetoric. Um, I do think that, you know, when Biden said Putin's goal is to reconstitute the Russian Soviet empire, that was as close as it comes to saying this doesn't stop at Ukraine. Yeah. And it won't. I mean, and if if a guy like Trump does, all he has to do as president is say Article five is dead. NATO is finished. Doesn't matter if the Senate has the, the power to keep him from withdrawing from the alliance. Uh, membership in NATO without enforcement of Article five is the death knell of NATO. And if you're saying that, then again, who's going to come to the aid of the Estonians or the Lithuanians if Russian tanks roll in? May, I hope the rest of Europe would, but the United States under Trump has made it clear it won't. By the way, Estonia does meet its 2% GDP spending on defense. So they, they technically deserve even Trumpian collective defense. Thank you. Michael Weiss, thank you so much for this incredibly brilliant interview. And my big takeaway from you is we have to deal with our internal problems and stop making it so easy for us to be wedged and targeted. And, you know, one way to do that is to introduce the history of intelligence and counterintelligence into civics education yes. curriculum. You know, again, it's it's not all about social and political movements. It, it, yeah. it helps to learn how law enforcement goes about doing things. You learn the scientific method in high school. You should know this is how the FBI collects evidence. This is how forensic crime uh, examination or investigations work. I mean... You know, uh, th there's a real failure of imagination on the part of the broader electorate. And it's not that hard to get a kind of basic course in this subject matter. The website is michaelweissjournalist.com, W-E-I-S-S. -S. Uh, your book, uh, Inside the Army of Terror, about ISIS is already available. But your next book on the GRU is coming. When can people purchase that? Probably not for another year. So it, okay. it was going to be what was going to be a quickie airport read has turned into <laughs> how wonderful Robert for us. history of 
Incredible. Fantastic. I can't wait Fantastic. for that. Man. Genuinely. Thank you so much for your time today. No problem. Thank you. Take care, guys. Thank you.